Hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in to watch us today and to listen to our guest speaker, Danella Kamara. And my name is Jill leach Klagic, and I'm the president of the Sonora Writers Group. And Danella, we're so happy to have you here today. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> and I'm happy to have you share with us Waiting for Wings by Danella Kamara. You're going to talk to us a little bit about this and maybe read some from it? I can. Okay, here you go, Danelle, it's all yours. Okay. Well, Waiting for Wings is, uh, and the subtitle is A Child's Journey, is about, uh, is autobiographical, uh, about me growing up and what it was like to grow up in a town in which it was labeled, Yuba City was labeled, uh, the worst town to live in in America, <laughs> twice. And I think they must have been there during this summer or the dead of winter. But uh, actually, Yuba City was, it was a really magical place in, in many ways. As an 11-year-old, I helped my mother skin and uh, can uh, the rosy kiss, the rose kiss, juicy Rio Osa gin peaches, big as a man's fist. They hung like innocent children in the leaf folded orchards surrounding Yuba City. Their ripe scent fragranced August evenings. Fuzz tickled our noses and made us sneeze as the sun sank behind the Sutter Buttes. Dad was a Sutter Basin farmer. Mom ran the house and kept five kids in order. I was the oldest. Not even the arrowed flights of autumn geese warned us of the tragedy that struck our little town at 1 a.m. on Christmas Eve. And like the levee melting away under the force of the Feather River, our fragile family fabric began to give way as well. I hoped and prayed that my newfound faith would help me find my own wings. I always wanted to be older than I was, to know more than I knew. I always wanted to ask the question, why? And never got enough answers. And uh, at a very young age, I wanted to know uh, what the rules were and never seemed to get them until after I broke them. And so when I was writing uh, the story here, they're like little vignettes. Uh, some of the few are rhymed and metered, but mostly are just free verse poems. And they, each one tells a little part of the story and the overarching story has to do with, um, with how I became a Christian at one point, and how that helped me during the most difficult time of my life. And it also helped me to forgive, and that, that took a while. But I wanted to answer the question for you, which nearly everybody asks me, right, when they meet me, is, how did you get that name, Danella? And so this is called For Spite. I was named For Spite. Dad thought I should be named Penelope. Mom thought I'd be called Bad Penny and said no. Dad said, she'll be a redhead you know. Mom said, how do you know? Dad said, Mom was a redhead. Name left unresolved as he flew off to England. So Mom chose to name her future redhead in true Southern fashion after Uncle Don and Aunt Ella. Donella, nickname Donna. Every day at the post office, Mom said, any mail for me today? The postmistress, trying to be nice, simpered, no, Mrs. Leathers, there's no mail for you today. Her name was Donna. Mom knew that if I was named Donella and nicknamed Donna, the postal lady would exclaim, She's named her after me. <laughs> My mother took umbrage. No way would this rude woman claim her daughter as a namesake. So for spite. Mom changed the O to an E. Danella. The smarmy male mistress could never claim credit for my name. And I never had a nickname that stuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the early stories are about um, my dad being gone because he was overseas when I was born 
and not coming back until uh, I was 14 months old. And so those stories are in here. Uh, and there were some farming stories, uh, especially about uh, a watermelon bust. And that was kind of fun. Um, camp 2 was one of the camps that my cousin bought for, uh, and I was so thrilled that he did. Uh, it was uh, a patch of corn, actually a pretty big field of corn, and um, around that dusty old farm was, were watermelon uh, patches all around the corn. And um, so this is the story of being a farmer's daughter or at least finding watermelons. Summer sun scorched the parched, dusty farm where corn stalks, taller than our father, rustled in the breezes across Sutter Basin. We cherished the green winds in vibrating heat, dancing mirages across the pavement. Dust devils eddied around us like mini cyclones, sweeping into the windshield of our mint green Chevy pickup. Tulies clustered in mossy pools in an irrigation ditch between the road and Milo Maze, and lumped between them, watermelons nestled in tangled vines waiting to be picked. We cradled the melons like babies caught in clinging finger vines, tugged them free, then busted their mottled green skins against the tailgate. Digging our fingers into red pulp, we gorged our watery crust on watery crusts until our face and arms ran with sweet juice and our clothes wrinkled and stained from wiping our hands. All the way home, we bumped along in the back of the truck with the wind spiking our hair into sticky star points, singing, home, home on the range while bursting with watermelon contentment, and it was all okay. <laughs> you know, when you're a kid, it's, it's kind of a rare moment when you don't do anything wrong. You can go a whole day, and uh, that's a tailgate never to forget. Um, I, I really felt that uh, my parents' marriage started to break uh, when my mother's sister came to visit. And it was kind of a um, moment when I was aware of what was going on and my um, sister and brother, who also stood with me and watched from the kitchen doorway, um, we just, you know, we just saw what was going on and I knew what was happening, but my sister and brother didn't, and we were like very young. Uh, he, he was probably five, and I was um, eight or nine, and my sister just behind me. So this is called Eyewitnesses, and it kind of sets up the beginnings of the, my parents' failure in marriage. And, and I just want to kind of give you the idea. The idea. Um, Eyewitnesses. I'm going to the grocery store. Be right back, Mom called. Groceries. At the end of a one block walk where kids could buy jumbo gumballs for a penny, sugar daddies and jujubes for a nickel, and coke in cool green glass bottles for a quarter. They could stick to our teeth, rot them out, and give you cavities or worse, break. Yum. She was our guest. Mom's twitchy hipped sister wore tight cardigans, sweaters, and A-line skirts, and bobby socks. We used to say, shake them, but don't break them. I mean, we were kids, right? Um, real caddy-like behind her back because of how she sashayed down the hall to our bedroom and locked the door. We didn't know till later about our aunt's jealousy, her betrayal that could spoil her sister's joy in a marriage that had left her behind to do the family housework at the edge of age of 10. Georgia had done it all before this sister arrived. 
The forest green curtains drawn across the panorama window darkened the living room and the couch unseen except by three stair-step step children silhouetted in the kitchen doorway when the front door opened. I forgot to bring my wallet, she said. Okay, I'm not going to read you the rest of that. Mm. Um, but I thought, it, just as a teaser, that you kind of knew something was wrong. And I did, for sure. Um, eventually, after all the stuff happened, uh, we had a flood, and my parents took about two years, really, for maybe, to, to get a divorce. And they finally got one. Uh, but it was kind of like a war in the family. The kids were in the middle. So um, I finally left. And uh, this is called Leaving Yuba City. And I give you the idea of the beauty of the, of the town, even though it was called the worst <laughs> town in the, the, the United States. I left Yuba City for the last time on the Greyhound bus after a short visit with my friend to see our old empty house on Brown Avenue and found that my other friends had left already for various colleges. The Yuba City air, heavy with the scent of ripened peaches, floated with peach buzz, felt dank and sultry by the Feather River, winding between the Twin Cities and filled with geese like an arrow in the sky pointing south. I followed the geese to San Francisco where fog clogs the day like cold cotton candy, wind sweeping around State College where I studied many things like English, geography, history, and political science. I couldn't do math very well, but I earned enough, uh, learned enough to get a BA and teaching credential and that's about it. That day, tears blurred the bus windows when I thought about the house I'd never call home again. Juicy Rio gen Osa gems hanging like golden ornaments on peach trees. Fat beefsteak tomatoes ripening for canning. Hot dogs cooked over a bucket of coals on the sandbar. Barbecued salmon fillets fresh from the Sacramento River. And Canadian geese flying in V formation honking their joy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think we're just about out of time. And we need to tell but, people where to get this. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Waiting for Wings, and it's by Danella Kimura, last name K-I-M-U-R-A. Um, you can get them at Mountain Books, uh, Manzanita um, Arts Emporium mm -hmm. at Angel's Camp. And here's the scoop from Jamestown. And you can also um, uh, get uh, CD in collections that are uh, published by Manzanita Writers Press. Out of the Fire uh, has three of my poems, or four. Voices of Wisdom has uh, two short stories. And uh, Voice of Wisdom uh, 2 has also a couple of my short stories. Wine, Cheese, and Chocolate has short, short stories, chocolate, and uh, photography. Um, and Word Project Press published Waiting for Wings. Okay. And Amazon? Amazon.com. Amazon.com. And then here locally in the Sonora area would be Mountain Bookshop, and here's the scoop. And then over in um, the Angels Camp Calaveras is Manzanita. Um, Arts Emporium. Arts Emporium. It's on Main Street. Thank and, you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs>